welcome back. We're going we're to get started here because we're uh, working against folks wanting to get home and watch football maybe. So let's try to get that done. I know Debbie is what definitely wants to do that. Yeah? Yeah? All right. Yeah. So let's pray, okay? Father, as we talk about your church through the ages, as we talk about history, uh, Lord, we pray more. We pray for more than knowledge. Uh, we pray for insight and understanding that we might be more faithful followers of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's, uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, I'm just going to kind of do a, a quick overview of where we've been. Uh, and this, I find this to be a, a, a fascinating session because it really gives me handles for the space that I'm living in today. So just by way of review, we've been breaking up history into five broad periods, one through five. And I, this is a little blue eye, eyeball here, right? How do you see the world? What lens do you see it through? Um, and and the, the reality is, if we're not intentional about how we think about things, each of these periods tends to affect how we figure out how we view the world, how we, how we think about God, and how we think about the nature of humans, and the nature of the world, and, and church, and Bible, and things like baptism and communion, right? So we looked at the first three periods, right? The first period was the period of the apostles up through about 400 AD, when the church was really forming. I mean, the New Testament hadn't been yet collected, right? And so it's, they're really running on letters that are being passed about and using the Old Testament. And in that first period, we saw things about how the church gathered for worship and whatnot, but the first thing we saw was how different it was from the Roman world, right? The Romans viewed the gods as hostile to humans, Christians viewed the God, God as a, the singular God who loved them, loved them so much he sent his son Jesus. Romans viewed the world as chaotic, and Christians viewed the world as an orderly, the, the, the creation account. They weren't arguing about evolution, okay? They were just saying, look, we worship a God who's ordered. And so they had a very radical different view of the world, and so they lived as people without fear uh, uh, of, of the universe because they knew that they were loved by God, and they'd spend eternity with God because of Jesus. And it affected how they worship and how they gathered for community. Just the idea of community. In the Roman world, highly segregated. A soldier would not meet with a servant, would not meet with somebody who was a noble. In the church, you'd find all of them. And, the, and, and baptism was a response to making a profession of faith. And communion was a meal where they remembered that Jesus had died for them. So ideas of grace being dispensed and all that kind of stuff were not in this world at all. So then last uh, week we looked at the church, the thousand year period of the church, and I tried to, it's a little bit of a, almost a, a message that went this two different directions. There's a part of the church, of the popes, who were trying to save people from being killed by barbarians, which is a really, really good thing, but they got this idea of kind of like a king pope, that the pope would be king. And spent a thousand years establishing this kind of Holy Roman Empire, and in the end had gotten themselves so far from the gospel that it was not recognizable. And they were selling the sacraments and selling things called indulgences, and had created this idea of purgatory, that when you die, you're not going to go to heaven, you're going to go to purgatory because you've got to work off your sins. And you could shorten your time in purgatory by receiving an indulgence, by buying an indulgence. By paying to have people uh, pray for your dead ancestors, you could take some time off them. We all have some relatives who are, might, might be a little notorious, don't we? Come on. <laughs> you know? And if you're a follower of Jesus, you're like, you know, they, they say that of us, absolutely. Uh, so, so that whole idea really began to infiltrate how people think about baptism, like, oh, and, and communion. You remember, if you were here last week, you remember you saying, this idea that whether a child, a baby, an infant is baptized or not um, affects its eternal fate. I said, right? Remember my little, my little experiment? Take two babies, baptize one, kill them both. Now I said, something's going to happen to me for doing this experiment. But So one goes to heaven and one goes to hell. So therefore I can control God. Right? It's a completely ludicrous kind of idea, but it's the idea that's at work. And we talked about 1,300, 1,400, 1,500s. Think about how many children are dying, the plague. I mean, 
if you're a mom or dad, you want to know where your babies are. Right? So all of that kind of affected me. But in the first period, the state determined what was true. You could have a different opinion. If you disagreed, disagreed with the state, they would send you to um, the Colosseum. You'd be entertainment. In the second period of time, the church was determining truth. And we brought that all the way forward where it came to a head uh, in 1517 on October 31st when a fellow named Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis um, to the door of the Wittenberg Church. And those 95 Thesis challenged lots of the things about baptism and communion and purgatory, all the things that we're talking about. You can Google 95 Thesis and read them, and they'll even be in English. You don't have to know German to do it. So that unleashed this period of time from about the mid early 1500s to the 1700s couple points that, that I've said in the other two sessions will play, uh, I'm going to say. These worldviews where the state defines truth and the church defines truth did not stop, and they still exist today. Now there's a new worldview that's emerged that says the Bible defines truth. And um, from that, you can talk about the world politically and the world theologically. Politically, the next 200 years, when Luther nailed those theses on the door, we had some of the most horrific wars of religion that we've ever had. Now, wars of religion is an interesting label because we have to remember that churches and states are not separate. And so there were a lot of German princes who really liked this smart guy named Martin Luther who was sticking it to the Pope because they didn't have to pay taxes. So when we talk about wars of religion, we're really talking about political wars between kings and monarchs and the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope about who's in charge and who's paying taxes. Yet they use the fervor of Protestantism versus Catholicism to fuel that. And there is a lot of bloodshed between the 1500s and the 1700s. In England, for example, the very Catholic king, Charles I, got his head cut off. And there was a little guy named Cromwell who then established it, and it was illegal to be a Catholic. They tore the monasteries down, they stripped the altars, a violent reaction to the establishment of the church, just in the English history. But guess what? His, his, his thing kind of ran, ran its course, and they brought back another king. And they're all worried about his Catholic leaning. Some of it's theological, some of it's political. And, and you can't separate the two. And, and, and we're going to talk about that. Remind me to talk about that when we talk about today. So we're going to, so those are, so what, what evolves in this period of time is the English church, which is connected to the state, the German church, which is connected to the state, other churches in Switzerland, which are connected to the state, trying to figure out how to use the Bible to answer the questions of God's nature, our nature as human beings. How do we gather for worship? How do we pray? That's, and so that's why one of the things you'll see in terms of these different strands of Protestantism, many of them have deep roots uh, that are connected to a country because that was how the world ran back there in the 1500s, right? And we're not even talking about the Orthodox Church because we just don't have time to talk about that. George, I'm sorry. It's just, uh, we're just gonna, don't worry about it. What you're gonna, so what we are going to see in Anglicanism, I call it is people, uh, now, well, the other thing I said was, so when the English church became Protestant, all the priests immediately became Protestant, and all those priests, for all their career, up until the day the state decided the church was Protestant, were what kind of priests? Celibate? No, uh, no. Celibacy didn't come. Uh, celibacy didn't come. That's a, that's a late. Um, it's actually, it's a, that's a whole other thing. Um, gosh, my mind. Get my mind back on track. Okay, so they were Catholic. They were Catholic. They said the Mass in Latin. So if you're in Lincolnshire, right, or you're up in Liverpool, uh, you know, or you're in Manchester, some one day, all of a sudden, the teachings of the church have changed. Have, have your teachings changed? 
right? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on whether or not you're, you know, what, what are you up on? But most of it, it's, it's a huge challenge for, we're just going to zero in a little bit here on the English church, but it's a huge challenge for any of these churches in, you know, Luther's church in, in Germany and whatnot. So how do you educate the clergy to get them, clergy to, get them to appreciate what's going on? It's a huge challenge. The English church does it two ways. They use two, three vehicles to do it. They use the Bible, right? They want people to know scripture. They use something called the Book of Common Prayer. And so the first time I, I went to an, an Anglican church, I was like, they're making this big deal out of this prayer book. I came from the Roman church. I was like, I, we didn't have prayer. My mom had a prayer book, but I, we didn't have prayer books. Like, what is the big deal about the prayer book? Because we only use about 30 pages of it. It's this thick. The big deal about the prayer book is, unlike, for example, the Roman Catholic Church, which has shelves of church teaching that experts have to know, our theology is contained in this book. If you want to know what we believe about baptism, read the baptismal service. If you want to know what we believe about communion, read the communion service. But I need to give you a way to read it. You need to read it with guardrails. Because what the Anglican Church does not do is that it does not say, let me tell you exactly what baptism is. Let me tell you exactly what happens. They will not do that. They will tell you what it's not, and they'll tell you if you've gone too far by reading the service. It's the same way with communion. And after I taught the first session, a couple of people said, Father, let me tell you what I, how, how I think about baptism. And they gave me a dot. I was like, great. Falls on my guardrails, I'm happy. I'm not going to argue with you. If you come over and say, well, I think it's over here, well, let's talk about that. Let's get out our prayer book and see what it is. Okay, that really is classic Anglican theology. We, 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 have thought, we define limits, right? So we do not say, let's use an example. We do not say, you must baptize your child. There are churches that have that doctrine. In fact, if you choose to not baptize your child, we'd say, would you consider praying for a, a, a prayer of thanksgiving? And I showed you in the prayer book last week. There's this little two pages in the prayer book. It's thanksgiving for the birth of a child. We should say thank you to God that this child's been born and mom's doing okay, right? We should say thank you. So we're not going to condemn your child to damnation, um, but, we're, but and we're not going to require you to get your child baptized. If you'd like to get baptized because it's your response, not the child's response, it's your response to your faith, we're happy to do that. Because there are entire households that had their families baptized, and the person in charge of the household made a vow to God and said, I'm going to do everything, everything, everything in my power to raise this child as a Christian. And if you read our baptismal service for infants, that's what it says. Right? So, that's a guardrail, isn't it? Not gonna, you can, you know, you can, you cannot. It's not a, that's a, a classic kind of example of a priest, uh, tends to be a thorny issue. So, the other bit, I've got this three color, this is a rope of blue and red and green. This is my artistic ability right now, showing up. Um, I said there were three things, the Bible, the prayer book, and then uh, Kraft, uh, the first archbishop would write homilies. He would write the sermons and hand them to the priest and say, this is what you need to preach to the people. And it was his way of educating the priests. Because you don't stop the car, right? If the church is a car moving along, you don't get to stop it and rebuild it and say, we'll be back to you in about five years after I get all these priests retrained. Right? you gotta, you got to retrain while the car is going forward. So he had the homilies. One question. Yes, sir. What if the uh, bishop does not teach properly to the priest or something? Great question. The question is, let me just say it out loud. What if the bishop does not uh, uh, teach properly? And so let's, that's a wonderful question because the other thing you'll see in Anglicanism is we're not congregationalists, right? Because during this period of time when there's all these splinter groups, the Baptists appear. And they've got their Bibles and they're reading their Bibles. And they're kind of saying, I just want to throw off the institutional church. Too much baggage for me. i got to figure this out. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to have this kind of stuff going on. But their response is, I'm going to figure this out myself with my Bible. Um, 
the Anglicans would say, you know, there's 1,500 years of history. Not everybody was completely insane. There were godly bishops and, and whatnot. So let's look at the teaching that's been given to us and reform it where it's in error. And so in the Anglican tradition, like the Greek Orthodox tradition, I think Russian Orthodox, maybe not Russian Orthodox, I'm not sure about that, but I can say for the Greek Orthodox tradition, they don't have a pope. But they have bishops who are ordained to guard the teaching. And they're just in council, right? If we're all bishops, and, and I have a cockamamie idea, I have five at least every hour, right? And I want to take my diocese down that path, you know, the bishops say, hey, why don't we pray about that? They're very polite, these bishops. And why would God tell you this thing and not tell the rest of us? If the Holy Spirit is leading you to some new teaching, some new way of understanding. So, so typically what happens is, um, uh, you know, sometimes they will comply and sometimes they'll go off on their own. And so the bishops, so when the bishop does that, um, the other bishops have to respond. We have a very modern, we have a this week example of that in the Anglican Church. So the Episcopal Diocese of Albany does not have a bishop right now, right? They're in the process of having a search. There's a committee that acts on behalf, when there's an absence of the bishop, there's a committee that they're called the ecclesiastical authority. That's what the bishop is. He's the authority of the church. The Diocese of Albany Standing Committee authorized same-sex blessings two weeks ago. The Diocese of Down and Jamore two days ago said, we no longer have a partner relationship with the Episcopal Diocese of Albany. Some of you are from the Episcopal Diocese of Albany. You know we would go to Ireland and they would come there. And Bishop McClay, uh, McClay or David McClay is like, sorry. And he said it very politely. We've had a long, wonderful relationship with the Episcopal Diocese of Albany. It's kind of come to this season where we need to not, where that relationship is ending. So that's the kind of discipline that happens, you know, with the, with the bishops playing each other. Now for the common person who comes on a Sunday, they could end up sitting under bad teaching. What happens if a bishop is godly, got great teaching, and the priest is off the rails? Same thing can happen. Really hangs on your leadership, okay? So we have three strands in Anglicanism. There's an Anglo-Catholic strand, people who gather about the table in worship, who want to, and they, and they are um, very pious folks, um, and, the, and we're in an area where there's lots of Anglo-Catholicism, and you'll see that in the fact that we wear vestments, and there's candles, and the candles sometimes are, uh, and there's a brass or bronze cross, maybe even a crucifix. My first day at seminary for evening prayer, the dean of students got up and apologized for the popery, that's the Roman Catholic visuals that were there. And I, I'm looking around and I can't find them. I mean, we got a wooden table. We got some nice stained glass. Everybody's like in cassock and surplus. I'm like, and it was the two candles on the altar. And our Nigerian and Kenyan brothers and sisters wanted to know what those two candles were doing on that table. Because they don't call it an altar. They call it a table. You can go to Northern Ireland, and when it's time for the celebrant in his suit with a tie to celebrate, and he's Anglican, to celebrate communion, a light comes on the table, right? And the, and, the, and the light is on the northern end of the table, which says, you get yourself out from between the people, because you are not our mediator. Christ Jesus is. And they literally stand, and he will stand here, the people will be there, the bread and wine will be there, and he'll pray the communion prayer. They're not Anglo-Catholics, those folks. They're the evangelical strand. And we're all in the communion together. We love the prayer book. And it's guardrails, right? As long as that, as long as that person who's Anglo-Catholic is not saying, I'm, I'm offering the sacrifice of the Mass for the souls of the people, that's outside the rail. If he says, no, we're coming to the very living presence of Christ, and we're remembering his death and, death and resurrection, and I'm doing the candles on, on the altar, uh, and the other guy's doing it with a suit, we're, we're fine. We, we leave some space, okay? And then there's the charismatic strand. People who are very much led by the Holy, Holy Spirit. And they all kind of coexist together. And when all three are together, it's wild to watch. And it's funny to watch. <laughs> and, but, they, but you have to know your theology and, and your guardrails. And, and overused strength becomes what? A weakness, right? So anybody gets a little too far in any one of these things, become weakness. And, and sometimes it's nice to have that kind of balance. Because 
the Charismatics will remind the evangelicals who live up here, because we're still constantly studying the scriptures, to say, you know, God also is Holy Spirit and might lead you if you pray. You know, and the evangelicals will say, yeah, thank you. Uh, could you stop speaking in tongues? Because the Bible says unless there's somebody there to interpret it, don't do it publicly, right? So we have a rant on with each other. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to that, that brings us now to um, this fourth period of time, um, which is wildly important. There's been, there has been hot years and years of, of bloody massacres. You know, um, the Huguenots, there's a, there's a famous massacre, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where uh, Catherine de' Medici is concerned about the rise of the Huguenots as an organization. It's a political concern. And on St. Bartholomew's Day, during, there's this huge Huguenot wedding happening. Everybody's coming to town for the wedding. And they, in the middle of the night, go in and kill them all. So the Protestants respond in a very Christian way. They attack the Catholics. This is what's going on. I landed in France and was presented a Huguenot cross so that I could remember the people that I was visiting. That's how powerful, because my wife wasn't with me. It was a stupid move. There's a whole other story there. I'm standing by a river, there's flowers in France. I'm looking at a pastor buddy, he's looking at me. We both look at each other at the same time and say, you're really ugly, I wish my wife was with me. So <laughs> we should have brought our wives to France. What, what, what were we thinking? But the, the wild thing was, this is 1500s. I'm there in the year 2004, 2004, and they're presenting me a Huguenot cross. <clears throat> right, so these things are very, very powerful. So as these wars are going on, People are struggling with all this bloodshed in the name of Jesus because it's kind of, that's how they see it. They see it as Catholic versus Protestant. May, may, and I, I tend to see it more as state versus state. But anybody know a guy named uh, Rennie? Rennie Descartes? Yeah. <laughs> His friends call him Rennie. I think, therefore, I, think therefore I am. Where was he when he thought that? Hmm? He was laying on a bunk. He was a soldier in a religious war, killing his countrymen. It was 1619. I think, therefore, I am. He is a smart guy. He's looking for a new first principle. This first principle of, 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 of Jesus is causing us to kill each other. Can't we find a new first principle to order our lives around so that we can stop killing each other as human beings? His goal is not a bad goal, is it? But when he says, I think, therefore I am, here's the picture I want you to have. Before Descartes, if this is God, right, if this is God, and this is me, I look up and I say, in the beginning, God. And I'm looking through this lens and trying to understand my relationship with God, and I'm doing that using the Bible. If I'm an Anglican, I'm using the Bible with the teaching of the prayer book and the, and the, and the homilies, right? That's how I'm viewing the world. When Descartes says, I think, therefore I am, he is essentially saying, in the beginning, me. And so he steps out from underneath, if, you, if I could use that visual metaphor, he steps out from underneath this idea that God is sovereign, God knows everything, I cannot know what God knows, and he says, you know what? I'm going to stand right here. And I will use my mind and my intellect, and I will judge God and the church and the teachings of the church. That is what happened when he did that philosophically. And that's the simple model that you need to know as we think about the next 500 years of history. Are we sitting under the authority of God? And if it is the authority of God, what is that authority? Is it the Bible? Is it the Bible and the church's teaching? How is it? We're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, or is it my human reason? Most Now, what else is happening during this time period? Descartes did this in 1619. Right? 1619 is when he did his I think, therefore I am. In 1543, Copernicus, on his deathbed, a Polish priest, published his thesis that the earth revolved around the sun. 1543. Right, we gotta remember this, right? People are still thinking, flat earth, flat earth, flat earth. Oh, maybe there's something else happening. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he has a completely new model of the universe. Newton, 1666, right? The apple falls, gravity. I could, I could regale you with a number of things that the human brain is figuring out. I would say because God ordained it to be, but they, some of them would, some of them wouldn't. And there is this real optimism in human humanity, in the sciences. It's the enlightenment. And so you see art no longer, the art up until this point is always Jesus on the cross or Mary holding the baby Jesus or there's all these Bible scenes and all of a sudden it becomes pictures of people, scenes of a river, nature. I mean, it's beautiful stuff, but the entire world is moving that in the beginning, me. That's what's going on. And so, um, so much so that a fellow named John Locke in 1695, 1695, think about this, writes a book, you can get it today on Amazon, it's in print, called The Reasonableness of Christianity. I ask you, is Christianity reasonable? That God would come to earth and sacrifice himself on a cross and die for our sins, for the sins of the world? There's nothing reasonable about Christianity. Yet Locke writes a book and it, it influences a generation. And he says, look, we know there's a God. Just look around nature. You get that from Romans, by the way. <laughs> okay, the book of Romans. Um, we know that there's such a thing as right and wrong. There's a moral center that's largely we get from the scriptures. And we know that Jesus is the Messiah. Can we just stop at this point and stop fighting about baptism and communion and everything? So he's writing that. One guy takes it another step named David Hume, and he begins in the mid-1700s to say, well, we don't need the hypothesis of God. All, all the court wanted to do was stop going to war, right? But this whole, unle he unleashed this whole strain of thought, kind of this age of reason. And so truth at this point now is really going to be based on reason and science and evidence, right? So it's human reason. And there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about that. But now we got, we're going to get to what that leads to. But let me just pause at this point. Because lots of times I'm going to go back to all of these things continue. So, so let's talk about the authority in our lives. What has authority for us? If you're a Roman Catholic, the authority is the church. And they'll say it's tradition plus scripture. Now, tradition doesn't mean that the choir, when they go to communion, goes down this way, comes up, and we go, we get, we get, we get briefed on how to do this, okay? That's not, tradition is the teaching of the church. And so... And tradition is given equal footing as scripture. The Anglican Church, a fellow named, um, oh gosh, dude, he was Queen Elizabeth's theologian. Um, Andrew. No, 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 not, not, not Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria. Not, anyway, he, people, you'll hear this, I want to I want to disabuse you of this. You'll hear like, well, we have three legs of a stool, scripture, tradition, and reason, blah, 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 blah. No, we don't. No, we don't. We don't. Claire, we have a big wheels. Anybody got a big wheels? Ever seen a big wheels tricycle? Scripture is the front wheel. And we have two wheels called tradition and reason. And the teaching is from Richard Hooker, that which scripture doth not plainly teach. That which it doesn't plainly teach, human reason may be prevailed upon. And the traditions of the church, in so much as they do not contradict holy writ, are acceptable. That is not three equal legs. That's like, you follow God's word, right? Use your brain, but make sure it doesn't counter God's word. And if you like the way the choir, you know, if, if there's some traditions in the churches, the way they've understood uh, church life and whatnot, that's, that's fine. So, um, and, and David made this point, I think it was last week, these three things continue today. How are you seeing the world? How are you, as you think about the world, seeing the world today? Now, what, 
this, the, the amazing thing is there's stuff that happens in the academies, the universities, um, that takes a hundred years sometimes to show up. So, you know, people are looking at the world. They're, they're struggling with war. They're trying to understand, you know, if, if God is love, how does this all work? The same kind of questions that we have. And there's a guy named Schleiermacher. He lives in the mid-1700s, about 1835. And he's looking, and, and, so he's living in the 1700s, right? So he's here, using his brain. He's reading scripture. Uh, the same, at this time, they start discovering original manuscripts. The understanding of language is advancing, and they start really critically looking at God's word. How come the four gospels don't say the exact same stories? You know, they, 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 they're troubled by that. And so it's called textual criticism and historical criticism. It goes on today, but it was born in about the mid-1700s. Schleiermacher gets to the end of his conclusion and says, has difficulty believing in the miracles of Christ and, and concludes that Jesus is the most God-conscious man that has ever walked the face of the earth. But you too can be God-conscious. We can awaken the God-consciousness in you. This sounds like some yogi that you're going to pay 500 bucks for and go on to the top of a mountain. Schleiermacher writes this in the mid-1700s. He's teaching it in a seminary. Because we're funding theologians to do stupid things with the Bible, by the way. That's a whole other story. Soapbox I can get on. But a guy follows him named Hegel. And he says, I don't like Schleiermacher. What's really happening is the human race is evolving. Darwin, this, you know, Darwin has published his work in this time period. And Hegel says, we're evolving. We're evolving in a Hegelian spiral up and up up until we become perfected and Christianity was a necessary stop in the evolutionary spiral but it is now time to throw it off because it's hindering us now you may say Dave what do these philosophers have to do with anything they're New Testament theologians in Germany and they are they are they lead to the point where during this age of reason in the 1960s, there's a group called the Jesus Seminar, really, really smart guys, that decide to vote on which verses of the Bible in the New Testament they believe are accurate. Oh, yes, they're voting on God's word. Okay? And they conclude that the Gospel of John is thrown out. Completely. There is not a miracle that lasts. These, and, and these folks who are doing this are teaching in the seminary. Now, you asked the question about bishops, right? You know, now think about the priests that are being, you know, bishops are usually a generation older than the priests. So these young priests coming out at age 30 are saying the Nicene Creed, I believe in God, you know, Jesus Christ. They got their fingers crossed behind their back. That, that is what has happened so often to, to the church. They're wonderful people because, first of all, they, they're, they're drawn to this idea of God. They usually have... Compare, uh, concern and compassion for the poor. Injustice troubles them. I mean, they, their hearts are good, but the way they're kind of coming at them, the way they're being indoctrinated, is completely dismantling anything that this first period looked like when people would go to their death. Right? But all is not lost during this time period, because during the same time period, the Great Awakening happens. Not once, twice. George Whitfield, John Wesley. I mean, we don't have time because I want you to understand the lenses that affect us. But during this time, God is not silent, and amazing things happen, are happening. And, and so we had more time we could talk about that. Um, you know, John Wesley, fam one quick John Wesley story, right? He's an Anglican priest. Now, what that means, and this is the 1700s, what that means is the state church has gone to sleep because, because of all the wars. It's, it's kind of this deism. You go to church on Sunday because that's what you're supposed to do. Wesley becomes an Anglican priest. He goes over to one of the colonies. Uh, I think it's Virginia. He doesn't know Jesus. He does not have a good experience. Um, probably the worst thing he did was he fell in love with a girl and didn't have the courage to ask her out on a date. And so, and, she, and you know, this is all back then where people are arranging all this kind of stuff. And he's supposed to, like, you know, court this young woman so she can become his wife. And he's a chicken. He doesn't do it. 
So she's like, well, fine. I'll let this guy call me. So what does he do, at, what does he do on Sunday morning? He refuses her communion at the rail. <laughs> Let's just use a different word. He excommunicates her. That's how you excommunicate someone, right? <laughs> her father is so mad. They have to smuggle him on a ship because her father wants to kill him. <laughs> okay, because he's just a big chicken. This is God's, these are God's stories. Like, you need to know this story. So he gets on a ship and he goes across and there is a storm. And like masks are breaking off. And there's a bunch of Monrovians singing psalms. Joyously singing psalms as they're probably going to die. And Wesley is looking at him thinking, where did they get that faith? Where did they get that faith? The John Wesley you know started as a chicken. Okay? Uh, and he gets across, he lands in England, he walks down the street, and he goes to a nightly Bible study, and they're reading the preface to Romans, a commentary on that. And he says, I feel my heart strangely warmed. And that's when he meets Jesus Christ and becomes the John Wesley that you know. And this is one of the great stories that's happening during this age of reason while Schleiermacher and Hegel are doing all this stuff. God moves through his church and moves through his people. So I want us to be people of hope. And so, you know, to preach out in the open air was, a, was not an acceptable thing to do. Anglican priests are polite, aren't we, Father? We wear our coats and, you know, we're very polite. Well, at least the ones in England are. Um, and so, the night before, he preaches his first open air sermon in Kingswood. Kingswood is a coal mine. England in this time period is a drunken, disorderly place. And he's going to go stand on a spit of coal and preach to 10,000 miners. And he writes this in his journal. You can read all of his stuff in his journal. It's online. It's fabulous. He's going to preach on Luke. And he says, is it, a, it is a vile thing, a vile thing for a man of God to preach outside in the open air. Tomorrow, tomorrow I will make myself more vile for our Lord Jesus Christ. And he goes out. I mean, he's just, it, it, and he's, it's amazing what he does. That happens during this period. Okay. So, the fifth period, it's kind of like post-modernism, people who are, you know, how do we establish truth today? Experience. Experience. Thank you. So we're still doing what? This little, I love this little model. We're still doing this. Now, under the age of reason, it was like, what's going on in my brain? But now it's like, what's going on in my heart, you know? the most deceitful of all organs, as the Bible would say. So if I experience love a certain way, or I experience God a certain way, if that's my experience, that's my truth. That's what we, the world we live in. People are making decisions about all sorts of things today. Um, and so it's still, but it's still the same models. We step outside the authority of Scripture. Um, and so why does, so, um, and, and it goes on today, but don't lose hope. In 1977, the bishop of Uganda stood against Idi Amin and called him out for what he did. Idi Amin killed him that night. Why does Anglicanism matter, right? This is what you maybe I've never actually said that. Anglicanism, for me, matters because it's an, it is a tradition that looks through these five periods of time to the early apostolic age and tries to hold on to things like the Apostles' Creed and the teachings of the Apostles and the breaking of the bread, Acts 2.40 through all of these periods. It doesn't check out its mind. It uses its reason. Some of the best writings on scripture come from the evangelical strain of Anglicanism. And yet it's not so, old, it's, it's not just a religion of head because you have charismatics and Anglo-Catholics that tend to, when we get it right, about one day every five years, when we get it right, those things are temporary. And it says it's okay to use your brain, but it can never trump scripture. It's okay to have some tradition and understand tradition church, but it can never trump scripture. <clears throat> it, is a, it, is a, it is a religion that's trying desperately to stand under God. And so when a bishop or a priest does this, we call him out. And, and it gets messy and it's not fun. Uh, but Anglicanism, for me, matters because we're, as we look through history, it's trying very hard. Um, to, to, to hold on to those things.
And the last bit here is, I have said a few times, theology is never done absent politics, economics, etc. Today, I hear lots of young evangelicals, doesn't matter what denomination is, I don't want to be political. At the bottom of every political decision is a moral choice. Yeah. It's a moral choice. I want my moral choices to be governed by Holy Scripture and by Almighty God. And so what, what concerns me, think about John Locke, think about David Hume, think about Descartes. They were struck by the violence of their age. And to try to solve it, what did they do? They stepped outside from underneath the authority of God. When I hear a young pastor say, I don't want to be political, it's a pastor who's troubled by our age. And rather than say, I'm going to just stand tall, rather than be like the bishop under Idi Amin who's going to challenge him, I don't want to talk about it. That's exactly what the church did in this period of time. The institutional church in England was irrelevant during this period of time. John Wesley was not allowed to preach in an Anglican church. George Whitfield, an Anglican priest, was not allowed to preach in a pulpit in England. These heroes of ours were banned from the institution, yet God raised them up. But what I see happening, what I'm worried about now is, right, why, why do we do all this, right? If those who don't know from history are uh, going to repeat it, right, that very famous quote. I see today as people are using this, just so confused about their identity and their purpose and their meaning, right? The world is confused about that. We have the answer for that, but it will mean that we will have to engage in things like politics. Yuck. Anyway, now, David Evans should at this point say, is that the teaching of the Anglican Church? Uh, up until about three minutes ago, I was teaching Anglicanism. Now you're getting Colin's personal opinion on kind of, you know, where we are in history. But that's, uh, I'll take questions at this point, or I can just go on for another half hour. Questions, comments? I say that's Bible. That's Bible. That's Bible teaching. All right, thank you. Well, I want to be respectful of people. I'll hang around for a while because that clock is slow, which I love. Uh, but it is 11.15. We started about 10.30, so I said 45 minutes. Um, Questions about, any question that you thought, gosh, I want to get this answered, and they didn't get an answer. I know for some people, baptism, communion, a lot of the stuff looking this way, we end up seeing it through this thousand-year period of the church, really can affect us, especially because we do have this strand of Anglo-Catholicism in, in our midst. Right? I have arguments with priests all the time about this. Episcopal priests and Anglo priests all the time about this stuff. Yes? I wasn't here last Sunday, but what you talked about the two babies? So last Sunday, the, last Sunday, the church, this is a thousand year period. <coughs> the church, by about the 1200s, has really gotten itself to where it's ruling and influencing most of the world. And, and it has, it has um, determined that, yes, Jesus Christ died on the cross and there's infinite grace, but we, the church, are the dispensers of that grace. And so they... There are theologies where people who died, um, they, they would say, yes, when you're baptized, your sins are washed clean, but we sin again. So when you die, you die in a state of sin. And that means you're going to go to purgatory. Even a little baby will go to limbo. That's what, that was the teaching of the church. And they would say, you can, you can accelerate them getting out of purgatory or in limbo. Now, none of this is in the Bible, okay? Let's just be clear. By paying to have masses said on their behalf. Anybody buy a mass card or get a mass card for somebody who's passed away? Yeah, sure. I, have, yeah. I struggle a little bit with that because it's, it's an act of, it's an, it's an act of, um, my dad passed away and lots of, and where I'm, I come from a, a very faithful Roman Catholic family and they're, they're wonderfully faithful people. Um, my mom ran to every one of those masses that was said for my father's soul. Now I had a conversation with my dad before he died. I said, Dad, you know, how are you, how, are you, how are you and Jesus doing? He was not happy that I was not a Roman Catholic. So we're doing fine. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So what do you know about him? I know he's the son of God and he died on the cross for my sins, David. What is the problem here? I was like, nothing. I just want to make sure I'm good. You know, just like, you know, so, can I say one day? He goes, make sure, call him on senior trench. Tell him to come over and see me. So why not have his confession heard? Because there's this idea that if I die with unconfessed sin, I can't go to heaven. And that's the, that's the root teaching that they're trying to do. 
That's not in the scripture. And it was abused to the point where they were charging money for communion, uh, for masses to be said and baptisms and things like that. So, so Kevin was talking about that story being the two babies. So baby, so if, you, if you're living in the 1300s and the bubonic plague comes and a third of Europe's population is gone mm -hmm. and you have to bury one of your babies and you didn't get them baptized, the teaching of the church is say, your, your child is not in heaven. Your child's in limbo. That is not that teaching has a strong grip on people. The last day, the last hour, the last minute of my first cure, my first church that I served for five years, an older gentleman came up. He had a, he had a, 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 a handshake that would just break your hand. And he said some very kind words to me. He said, Father, I trust you. I just have one question. Where's, where's my son, Joe? Joe died in childhood. And this guy is a tough guy, and with tears in his eyes, I said to him, he is in the loving arms of a merciful God. And he squeezed my hand hard. It's just like, now I'm crying for a different reason. I'm like, man, this hurts. <laughs> and he goes, oh. and he says to me, are you sure? And I said, John, I am absolutely sure. And he said, then I will believe you. Thank you. If that, this period of time has a strong grip on us. Because there's a nature, and, and it's because there's a, there's a thing in us as human beings where we want to add to our salvation. We want to do something. It's a tendency that we know rather than receive the free gift. There's a fancy word for it. It's called Pelagianism, but it's been rampant through the centuries, but we always want to do something. My sarcastic says it's Jesus Christ plus chocolate chip cookies. Right? The death and resurrection of our son Jesus Christ isn't enough. I have to go do something. Instead of living in response to his love, we want to earn his love, right? That's, that's what's going on. And that really played out here in a big way, in all sorts of ways. I love what you I'm sorry, there's a question over here. Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Uh, this was a full semester uh, a presentation of Father Larry's. Uh, I can't uh, find the right adjective to uh, express uh, what you uh, present to uh, all of us. So, let's, let, let, let's go to one. Do you know what the early Christians would pray? They would pray, Maranatha. Maranatha, which means, come, come Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus. Come Lord Jesus, come. We've been praying, Mar come Lord Jesus, come, since, since period one. Um, so I think we really need to look. I, I think four and five together are creating a, the, the dominant worldview of the day, right? This is the dominant worldview of the day, are creating... Um, a situation where Christ Christians will be again the minority, I think, in the West. The Global South, uh, today 83 million Anglicans worshiped Jesus using the order of the service that you used, 83 million. 55 million of them were on the African continent. It's stunning. It's stunning that it's vibrant and it's alive, and they wouldn't be worrying about the clock. <laughs> okay, they just would not be. So there's a, uh, and they're, um, they're, they're led by very educated people. Um, so I'm, there's a part of me that's optimistic, right? My hope rises. There's a part of me that sees the evil in the world growing that gets me a little discouraged. And then I realize this is what the book of Revelation says. The book of Revelation says evil will rise, but good rises. So we know ultimately it's all going to the consummation. You know, the last day to, 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 the end, to the end of the world. It's going to Jesus coming to restore his good creation. The question is when, and he tells us not to, let's <laughs> get the scriptures today. He says, don't, don't focus on when. Um, I do think, though, us having clarity about our beliefs, us having a sense of um, how I think about things, the lens I look through, I, I feel we're going, we're going to have, we are going to have to behave much more like this. Right, the first period being persecuted by the state. Um, 
by the state and by the intellectual powers at, that be. Right? The, and here's what we don't, we don't do well with. Um, we, don't, we don't want to be um, hostile or aggressive It's not necessarily in our nature, but I think if we're going to have to find a way to stand for our faith, um, that, and that will cost us certain things. Well, Marxism is not exactly, it is very exactly affecting uh, sure. states. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole the yeah, the whole movement of the whole movement of thought right now is really nothing. You know, the Bible says it's nothing new under the sun. But the, but, the, but the hold that it seems to be gathering in the West is, is striking to me. Um, but there's a whole geopolitical thing in terms of, um, do you know this really now? We are really are off. Um, yeah, just, you know, when you start looking at what's happening globally, um, you know, China is playing, is using the globe as a chessboard and they're playing economics. Um, mm -hmm. ec and, and the question is, will their, will, their, will their form of capitalism, which isn't capitalism, will it collapse? Before they before checkmate, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of people speculating that. Why don't we end it here at this point? And uh, are, there, are there other questions? The only, the only thing I that this is sort of leading into our Luke study, where you pointed out to me the, the prologue to Luke. Could you could you say what? Yeah, I'm excited about the Luke study. Um, so, but before, let me set that up. Now, when I grew up and watched TV, Love Boat was uh, Fantasy Island, right? That's what I would watch. Anthropologists and sociologists study what are the number one TV shows because we make them number one by what we tune into. It's a reflection of society. All the number one shows for the last 20 years have been CSI, CSI Las Vegas, CSI New York, Law & Order, and all the 58 spin-offs of Law & Order, right? They are shows that with scientific certainty say this is exactly the person who's guilty and justice is done. Every now and then they don't, but, it, but if justice isn't done, you know justice isn't done. Anthropologists and, and sociologists say there is a yearning in this greatly enlightened <laughs> time that we live for certainty, for absolute truth. At a time when people deny there is such a thing, all the TV shows that are popular are about absolute truth. The Gospel of Luke opens with these things are written to you, O Theophilus, so that you might be certain that Jesus is the Christ. I can't wait for y'all to study Luke. All right, with that, it's a wrap. All right, okay.